All right, so as we continue reading about the growth of the early church in Acts, we've been reading the last few weeks how they have just continued and continue to grow and expand, and that is great, but they have been experiencing some growing pains. Um, last week we talked about the growing pains in the outer community, how some of the other religious leaders didn't like it and were trying to push back. Tonight we're going to read about some of the growing pains that they experienced inside their own fellowship. And we'll, we'll be talking about uh, conflict resolution uh, tonight. It, those, uh, that's what our verses are about. And it's a good thing for churches today to, to talk about because any church that takes its mission seriously and its health seriously needs to recognize the importance of addressing conflict in a healthy way. You might remember a few weeks ago that we did read uh, descriptions of the early church, like in Acts chapter 4. It said that they were all of one heart and soul, and there was not a needy person among them, which was a beautiful picture and is great, but that uh, constant uh, cooperating joy wasn't uh, it, it wasn't uh, nonstop because they were humans. And we even read that weird story of Ananias and Sapphira, uh, who kind of wanted to give a gift and, and get some recognition, but it didn't go over so well. They both dropped down dead. So definitely not just um, all warm fuzzies all the time. Uh, it wasn't a group of perfect people who always got along and never had any problems and were never upset. As we'll read tonight, conflicts did develop. And the reality is that conflict and tension have, from the beginning, come naturally in a church, the Christian church, uh, because any church is a group of humans. And whenever humans get together, part of being in relationship with other people there's just going to sometimes be disagreements, even with people who love each other. There will be disagreements and there will be conflicts. Even though we call the church a family and we refer to our church family, that doesn't mean that there won't be disagreements and conflicts because think of that word, family. Does anyone know any family that has never had any disagreements or conflicts? I don't think so. So calling the church a family is both something to celebrate and it should clue us in. Oh, we are a family of humans who are imperfect, so sometimes we're just gonna get on each other's nerves or maybe disagree about the best thing to do. And so, how do we handle that? How do we address that? We'll read tonight that the early church addressed its conflict directly and they took steps to resolve it. They allowed by resolving it, they allowed the church to stay focused on its mission. They, the leaders didn't let things get bogged down in heated, uh, like the blame game or anything, or heated uh, arguments. They addressed the conflict and um, addressed the problems so that they could keep going in their mission and function as a healthy body of Christ. So this example that we'll read, it shows us it gives us some concrete tools that we'll list later on this evening that we can use in managing conflict and moving ahead with our mission too. So uh, let's go over uh, some details first. With the increase in the number of people who are participating in the church, it was getting up to thousands and thousands of people. So the 12 apostles, like Jesus's 12 apostles, uh, minus Judas, and then they um, they ordained uh, Matthias to replace Judas as part of the 12 uh, leaders. So these 12 can't manage everybody by themselves. They can't manage this church of uh, over 3,000, maybe up to 4,000 or so by this point. So there's a big group of people, and as we've talked, many of them are from different countries, from different cultures and differences amongst any group will naturally arise when they are in relationship and the the conflict tonight is about food and it's about who's getting enough food um, the widows in the church received uh, support and help in terms of getting food 
uh, to get by. Uh, since they didn't have a husband in a patriarchal society, they wouldn't have been able to get jobs and get their own food. So uh, the church supported the widows in the congregation so that they could have enough food. And that's where the, uh, the upsetness comes in. So we're going to, in a minute, we're going to read Acts chapter 6, verse 1, and it's going to talk about the two groups that are in the church. First, there's uh, the Hebrews, or Hebraic Jews, and they would have been like the locals, like they either lived in Jerusalem, they were either native to Jerusalem or lived in Judea. They were from that area, they grew up in that area, so they all spoke Aramaic, which is probably what Jesus spoke in natural conversation. So there's like the locals, like the longtime native uh, Hebraic Jew locals. And then there's kind of like uh, the, the, the new folks to the area, like the out of town crowd. And they are referred to as Hellenists or Grecian Jews because they spoke Greek. And they would have grown up in some other country. They would have been Jewish, their family would have been Jewish. Uh, they would have grown up in some other country you know, maybe um, like a Syria or Egypt or a Cyprus or a Turkey or something like that. And now they are in Jerusalem. Maybe they came back for the big Pentecost festival and they stayed. Uh, or it is possible, um, since the, the dis disagreement is over how much food gets to different widows, um, one Bible commentary theory is that um, some of these women would have moved to Jerusalem, like which is the holy city, to have community and support, and kind of be closer to God. Kind of, kind of like their their husband is gone; they are kind of retired, and they want to uh, settle down in a holy city, a holy community, and, and spend their uh, final years um, in that special place. So, there's kind of a theory that Jerusalem might have been kind of like a retirement community that people from all over would have come to to kind of spend their last years in a city that had a lot of amenities and uh, the temple was there um, there was a good religious structure for support there um, so those are the two groups that we'll be talking about um, the difference between them was not an ethnic difference because they were both jewish they were all jewish the differences would have been linguistic maybe some cultural differences for people who grew up in different countries uh, they would have spoke different languages. So these are the two groups that we're going to hear about in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. So let me read that verse right away. In those days, the number of disciples was increasing. The Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So, like I said, it's really important in this society to uh, take care of this population who wouldn't have had the, the man or the husband uh, who was the only person that could have a job to support them. And in the Old Testament, God is very clear that anyone in the community, especially orphans, especially widows who need support, that the church reach out to care for those folks. Jesus had special concerns for them. This is a very specific and important mandate for the church uh, to be serving and helping these folks. It's their responsibility, the church's responsibility to care for them, but the group is just so big that some folks are feeling overlooked, some folks are feeling disrespected, um, the, the Grecian Jews are feeling like their group isn't getting as much attention, as the Hebraic Jew groups. And, and that is usually how most conflicts start. Like one person or group thinks that they aren't being heard or they aren't getting as much attention or they think there's some favoritism going on or someone feels like they're not getting their way but somebody else is getting their way. Uh, that's a very natural kind of human dynamic. So that's how the conflict arises. And before we read the next few verses that will show us how the early church addressed this conflict, let's talk about how we approach conflicts. Because every person will handle conflicts in a different way. So I've got a handout here. Uh, Regina, can you be our pastor outer for the evening? 
Everybody gets one. There we go. I'll take that one. So we're looking at uh, this side first. This side is a chart. So everybody gets one of these. Uh, there's a, a, a fun story to read on the back that you can read later. Uh, but we're going to look at the chart side first. And it's got different animals on it. Different animals and how each animal approaches conflict. So what you're going to be doing is looking at the different animal styles and trying to, to decide which one might be closer to the way you handle conflict, which animals approach or actions uh, sound similar to you. So don't try and read the whole sheet right now. You can save it and read the whole thing later. I'll just read kind of a summary of each animal. We've got a turtle a koala, a rhino, a fox, and a dolphin. So a turtle, as you might expect, uh, is not very assertive, but it's very passive. It doesn't uh, talk about conflict. It doesn't work to find solutions. They will kind of withdraw for safety, uh, like the one <coughs> I discovered in my yard when I was mowing uh, on Monday. It was withdrawing for safety, so I tried to respect its uh, personal space. A koala is more of an accommodating kind of animal. A turtle will avoid, a koala will try to accommodate, so they will embrace everyone. They're very huggy and cuddly, our koalas. They will sacrifice themselves and maybe even accept some of the blame. If it helps others to bring some peace, to come to an agreement, they might kind of take it on themselves if, every, if it'll make everybody kind of come together and hug it out. There's a rhino. You might expect rhinos are very kind of competitive and strong-willed, so they can be assertive, they can be domineering. They might use some smooth diplomacy, but more likely just kind of raw power because they believe that what they uh, want to do is the best thing to do. That should be the only thing that gets done. A fox, on the other hand, will work more towards a compromise. It's a little more uh, sly in that sense. So they will subordinate personal desires for the common good. Uh, they'll be creative and they will work towards effective compromises so we can all kind of figure out how to get along, what we need to do to kind of bend this way and, and all work together. Uh, a dolphin is more of a collaborator. A dolphin is assertive, but also can be kind of flexible and, and jump around when the waves come. They promote mutual respect, open communication, and invite full participation by everybody. So it's probably not going to be the case that you are just you know, kind of one animal uh, characteristic. You're probably going to be a mix of all of them, and that's okay. Each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. And as you'll see later on when you read the rest of the chart, some, each uh, animal's style is appropriate during different conflicts or disagreements or um, moments of the resolution, but also every animal's style might be inappropriate for some disagreements or conflicts or uh, points in, the, in the, the conflict resolution. So uh, think about which animal sounds the most like you. Take a moment to read the chart. You can even consult with the people around you and kind of check your findings, get a second opinion, and say, hey, am I more of a fox or a koala? What do you think? Uh, so you can get, get some opinions, and I'm gonna write some stuff on the board uh, to help you uh, think about, if you're this kind of animal, um, what, are, uh, what are some things to keep in mind? So. And I'll make the chart available online for folks who aren't here. They can open it and read it and be thinking about themselves, which kind of animal they might be. So as you've kind of decided what might be uh, your complex style animal that you most lean towards, and it's okay to say, well, sometimes I'm, I might be a koala, sometimes I might be a fox or something like that. I want you to think about, so what are your strengths in that it, what are the strengths of that way of approaching conflict? What are the weaknesses of that way to approach conflict? 
Think about the other animals that might be around you in the forest. What animals and their styles might complement you as helper animals or allies that kind of gel together like as a good team, different kinds of animals. And also, what other animals might kind of give you trouble, you might kind of butt heads with, um, might be kind of an uh, antagonist uh, kind of an animal. So, uh, who had some thoughts? Uh, you don't have to share anything. Um, you certainly shouldn't uh, uh, point to someone else and say, this is what they are. Uh, only share your own animal. There's no accusations. There's no, there's no condescending of anyone else's style. Uh, but who had one that that, that kind of really stood out and they say, yeah, that, that sounds like me. So who would it be? It'd be a rhino. <laughs> well, maybe rhinos would admit to being a rhino. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right, Joe, that, uh, that people don't want to, and there's some animals that, that we think are more uh, positive and some of these animals we think are more negative. And so I, I wonder if uh, the people who are kind of 100% rhino, uh, 100%, you know, and we all might be kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. If you're 100% rhino, you're probably not sitting in a uh, thoughtful Bible study pondering how you approach the world and deal with other people in the hopes of improving yourself. You know what I mean? Uh, so anyone who's like full on rhino uh, is probably busy telling someone else uh, what to do with their life right now, perhaps. <laughs> so what do you think? Anybody have any ones that's, yeah, what do you well, think? I just think, if you look at this quickly, uh, I can see some parts of the rhino and some parts of the dolphin to me. Mm -hmm. And I also think that human conflict depends on the situation, mm -hmm. the circumstances that, that are involved as to how you may respond, what may be needed, how you might feel about that. But those two, I can see parts of that in me. Yes, yeah. my wife, she can really show you. Yeah. <laughs> she gives me one down. For sure, for sure. And yeah, and some things, when they come up, you, you might you know kind of witness that conflict and say, uh, I don't need to waste my time with that. That's not important. That's just people, that's just drama. For drama's sake, I'm just going to avoid that. I'm just going to go into my uh, man cave and just not even. I'm, I'm just going to let them fight it out. I don't care. You like do do a turtle, just pull a turtle, and just go and hide somewhere. I'm going to go out in the yard. I've got the yard work to do. I got to go out in the yard for three hours while you fight inside. But if there's something, if someone's getting hurt and there's harm being done, you might say, "Okay, look, like we're we're drawing this line and it's been crossed and that's unacceptable." So, yeah, I, I do think that, it, at least in my, my life, it, when you're just dealing with situations like this conflict or whatever, if you want to have a successful outcome, you got to have respect mm -hmm. for everyone involved in it, even though you disagree with the other person, your person's or situation. Uh, mutual respect will get you a long way in mm -hmm. uh, communication, resolving conflict. And, and honoring each other, so mm -hmm. what they do. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Who thought of some strengths and weaknesses of their animal style? Whatever animal style you were, what kind of strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, yeah, right. Well, uh, due to combat training and what you have been instructed to do, Sometimes oh, it I is necessary it. to be a rhino. Mm -hmm. so, back in the days when I had to go in the forest and stop four balls, time when I had to stop fights. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Professionally, yeah. I was trained that way. Yeah. And I was trained to run into the trouble rather than wait for it. Yeah. And you were, you were a former uh, military police, right? Yeah. So it was your job to be a rhino. Well, then, in some situations. When I left that, I went to the Federal Police Department, which was a war zone ah. during the Vietnam time. Mm -hmm. And so there again, I had to do, when there was trouble, I had to be a right mm -hmm. And even since I've known her, we've seen times when there was trouble. And my instincts 
Maybe you come right in the middle of it. Yeah. Even though it was none of my business. Oh, uh, yeah. Even though. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, uh, when you've been trained to, to approach something in a certain way, it's hard not to. Yeah. And that was your job. You were trained to get in there and take care of it. Yeah. Well, the ladies at her apartment complex, this is before we married. We start to walk out, and there's a commotion of guys out there combating with each other. And I say, go back inside, watch TV for a while. Uh, no, let it go. Uh, <laughs> I got to get out here and get stopped. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden I realized I was about the only black one out there. Uh, oops. Uh, but I convinced them to stop mm -hmm. the trouble, and I convinced them that there were children watching the TV. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, later she didn't help me say, you know, just don't need to do that. Yeah, you, you don't have to step in. You don't have to. Right. And, and that's the hard part if you have kind of natural rhino tendencies of learning of maybe I don't have to step into every single disagreement I come across. Sometimes yeah. you need to be the turtle. Yeah. If it's not really your yeah. fight, your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, if it's if it's not about you, if it's not your business, and if nobody's getting hurt, you know, right? There's not any harm well, going. On. Somebody's getting hurt. It is your business. Yeah. Oh, well said. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jan, what do you think? I see this as so situational. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, there were probably many students in the schools where I was principal who didn't think of me any other way but right up. Sure. Sure. Uh, I took very few prisoners. <laughs> but uh, I, I see a little bit of my uh, style of managing conflict in each one of these. <clears throat> For instance, with a turtle, if you've already dealt with somebody ad nauseum, then uh, I, I can see just uh, going on about your business and letting it go, you know, whatever it is. But my husband was one of the best uh, conflict managers I've ever known and and this is kind of crude beware <laughs> but Tom Lawrence who would have been a really good judge um, said that that you never eat you never chew out somebody's rear <laughs> that you would eat out around and let it fall out by itself Five words. <laughs> and I've heard you say that so many times. In other words, you just give people a lot of rope mm -hmm. and let them, you know, go on with the situation. Yeah. And he was not confrontational. And sometimes he loved for me to wear the black hat, and he would wear the white hat and be so thankful. But he won that way with me. <laughs> but um, you know, I I think you can. I think the best thing, uh, way to handle conflict is to uh, do it in a collaborative way where uh, both parties can become winners. Mm -hmm. A new mm -hmm. model is created that's neither a hundred percent yours or mine, but it's something that both of us can buy into. Mm -hmm. But that takes that takes a great investment of time and mm -hmm. energy and understanding and many things and and I find that when people get into a conflict they want to go ahead and hammer it out instead of thinking it out and calmly assessing it and coming back to it. Mm -hmm. It was after many years of having children that I realized that answers to questions with kids don't have to be done that night. And and so I would get in the habit of saying, I'm gonna think about it. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, no, mother, don't. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want that, but uh -huh. I think thinking about it, sleeping on it, yes. and then coming back to it when you're in a different frame of mind often helps. Absolutely. Helps it. And so I don't know which one of these sleeps so well, I guess maybe I'm a sloth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a great key to not kind of reacting in the moment. Like if someone kind of shouts and puts you on the spot, it's just hard to, to um, peacefully weigh all the options and the consequences. You really need time to say, hold on, 
that is so important. I'm going to think about that, and I will get back to you. To give your brain time to process it and weigh this and that, and, and, and to do that, the, the kind of the dolphin work of collaborating and getting creative and, and uh, listening to the, all the people involved. Yeah. Well, think about these, uh, these different kind of animal types. It's a fun way to, to identify different styles of handling conflict so that when things arise, you can be a little more aware of yourself and think, what do I want to be like right now? Do I want to be a turtle and just, you know, let those folks do their thing? Do I want to be a rhino and get in there and put a stop to it? Do I want to uh, be a koala and just say, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about everything. Let's just uh, all hug. Uh, because different situations, like we said, would require, and uh, even in those columns, some situations are appropriate to use different kinds of styles. So kind of keep this chart as a guide and think about yourself. And, and often, like Ray said, uh, we have been trained to react a certain way. Uh, Ray had official kind of government training in the military, but we've all been trained in our upbringing, in the way we grew up. As kids, we were part of families or communities, and we um, subconsciously, you know, figured out how to survive in that family. Um, you know, maybe you might have had one loud parent or a quiet parent or two loud parents, or, you know, as a kid, we figure out how to get through our situation. And in a sense, we're kind of trained to handle conflicts in different ways. So uh, keep that in mind. Think about, uh, am I, what kind of animal am I being right now? Is that okay? Maybe that's good. Maybe I want to be a different animal. So, so keep that chart as a reference to think about. And uh, my next question for you is, uh, is a pondering question. I want to hear what you think. So we talked about what animals we might be at different times. Of course, our ultimate model in life is Jesus. So what animal do you think Jesus might have been? Think about the stories. Think about what he said, what he did, what he didn't do, what he was like. What animal do you think Jesus might have been? He was a lamb. That's a, very, that's a good answer. Uh -huh. what, which means, so what, what do you mean by that answer, Paul? He was an innocent sacrifice. I mean, I think on the highest level mm -hmm. you know, about the behavioral part of it. Mm -hmm. So in that, yes, so, so Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. He sacrificed himself. And kind of in the style breakdown on the animal chart, that's what the, the koala's style is kind of described as being willing to sacrifice yourself in order to um, help others or bring peace. So maybe in, in that sense, Jesus had some koala tendency because he totally sacrificed himself. Seemed like a rhino when he was turning the tables. <laughs> That's right. When he cleared the temple and he kicked over the tables and ran out the money changers. He was, I mean, physically, he was <laughs> charging in there and knocking them down. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Other ideas? What Jesus might have been? A dolphin, maybe. Yeah. 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 With all the wisdom and the humility and the peacefulness that Jesus had, he would have been so collaborative and he would have encouraged everyone. So uh, he would have been, you know, just the best kind of, of uh, leader to handle. <laughs> problems to get creative because he was always thinking on a higher level always thinking on a different track always outsmarting um, the antagonists the pharisees who try and trap him so he was super creative so he definitely would have had some dolphin tendencies yeah well i wonder if in all of those answers is the answer that kind of like we've said the best way to handle a conflict is to figure out how you need to handle that specific conflict. Regina, can I call on you again to pass out this handout, please? I've got one more handout. Uh, on the back, it's got another good story. But on the front, it says, Jesus in conflict styles. 
And you can see that each of the styles from our animal chart, Jesus uh, demonstrated at different points. He figured out what was the best, most appropriate way to, to handle this issue or that issue when it arose, and that's what he did. So sometimes he would turn and walk away. He would avoid. Uh, other times he sacrificed himself. Sometimes he charged in, kicked over tables. Uh, sometimes he was uh, good at compromising uh, like a fox. Sometimes he collaborated like a dolphin. So uh, it makes sense when you think about it that as, as the best human who was also divine, uh, Jesus could pull on the best characteristic that any different moment or conflict uh, would have needed. So uh, keep that chart and keep that in mind too. Like we've been talking, when you come up to situations or conflicts, you can think, what might be the best way to approach this one? Okay, well let's jump back into our story and let's see how the early church handled their disagreement, uh, the upset feelings that people in their church had. People were upset, they were feeling left out, they uh, were thinking there was some favoritism going on. So let's see how the early church handled it. I'll read chapter 6 in Acts, verses 2 through 7. So the 12, the 12 apostles, the 12 leaders, gathered all of the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests even became obedient to the faith. Okay, so let's talk about what happens here. Um, first, I, I think it's helpful to notice that the author, who was Luke, he doesn't get sucked down into the blame game. He doesn't uh, waste time saying, these people were right, these people were wrong. He doesn't say who's guilty in this situation or not. So what does that say about his primary concern in reporting this incident to us? What's most important that Luke wants to get across in this story? That the problem was solved. Yes, that there was a problem in the church. They addressed it, and they came to a good solution. That's right. He doesn't waste time saying uh, who was better or who was worse, who acted out. I'm sure, like when there's any conflict among any group of human people, there was probably some things said that were unhelpful. Maybe some, some name calling, maybe some accusations. You know, oh, okay. there's probably some whispers, you know, in the back halls. Have you heard that so-and-so is getting all the food that so-and-so should have so-and-so? You know, there was probably some of that going on, but Luke doesn't waste any time with that kind of drama. He just sticks to the facts. So, uh, reading this story, it can give us some good guides to conflict resolution today. Uh, let's see. I, I came up with uh, seven different um, uh, concepts that this story helps us learn about conflict resolution. The first one, uh, think about in these verses, who acknowledges the issue publicly and initiates the resolution? Who makes it public and who uh, gets the resolution started? Go back and check. Parishioners came with localized problems that they should have to know the problems because the Jews are treating our business. So the, the people who had the problem uh, speak it to who? The apostles. They reported the apostles, and the apostles reported to everybody. So 
the leadership takes responsibility to recognize that there is a conflict. If you don't recognize it, then you can't address it. They say, all right, people, this is a problem. Let's do something about it. Okay, who is involved in the meeting to discuss this problem? Everyone, the 12 call the meeting and everybody comes. Uh, does it just say a select group meets in secret to decide who's getting kicked out? No, it doesn't say that. Uh, does it say there was a, a backroom deal um, so that uh, so-and-so would be taken care of and a non-disclosure agreement was signed? Uh, no, it doesn't say that. Um, since all being a minister, all my friends are ministers, and I have heard just the worst stories about churches because they're human. I mean, again, churches are made up of human beings who are all imperfect, and that kind of stuff happens. It's kind of backroom deals, uh, a lot of secrecy. Uh, don't, we don't want this getting out. It shouldn't leave this room. It's just between us. Don't tell anybody. We're just going to take care of this. That's not what the leaders do here. They are open and they include everyone. What's that? I said men and women. Yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody. And, and one thing we don't have here is how much discussion did the 12 have before they brought it to the attention? Oh, yeah. I would make the assumption that they had a, a significant discussion on how do we handle this. Yeah. So they came together in yeah. harmony to present that. So it's a discussion behind the scenes. I bet you're right. I bet when the leadership group, the 12 leaders, received this problem, they said, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And they probably called a meeting and they said, all right, here's the problem. Let's come up with what are we gonna do? What's the best way to address this? So they, they publicly, they recognize that there's an issue. They include everyone in solving it. So what solution do the apostles propose and why? Well, they were smart enough to come up with proposals that everyone was agreeable to, uh -huh. which is amazing, really. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, that they were smart enough to say, okay, this will settle the issue. Uh -huh. I'm gonna write that down. They, uh, they sought consensus because everybody was agreeable to the solution that they worked out together. And as far as the solution goes, uh, what did they, what did the apostles propose and why did they suggest it? It's like seven men. Mm -hmm. And because they didn't feel like they should take away from what they were trying to do. So mm -hmm. that needed to be from the group of people. Yes. They, they said, we have this, this work that we are called to do, but this issue is important and we need to address it. There's just 12 of us and there's thousands of you. So we need to select some other people. We need to share this responsibility around and delegate this important work to others as well. So they shared the responsibility of serving the congregation. Because you know one person and one group can't do every single thing, but the, but a, an organization, a church works best when this person is doing their job they're called to do, this person is doing their job they're called to do, and this group or ministry team or what have you. Okay, what is the criteria that the leadership gives for selecting more leaders in verse 3? Well-respected. Well-respected, yes. Full of the spirit and wise, yes. Good people um, that you can count on, that uh, the, the rest of the community all respected and recognized these are good people. And that is really important um, to, to moving forward, is get the right people to get the job done. If, you get, if they got people who were not wise, who were not respected, it would not have gone over well. All right. Well, 
As far as those seven people that were selected, we don't really know very much about them because uh, not many of them appear in any of the verses. So we don't, uh, uh, besides the fact that they must have been well-respected, full of spirit and wise, we don't really know what they were like as people, um, but we do know just by their names, all of those names are Greek names. Those have been Greek names from other countries, so that tells us all these people would have been from that Hellenist, Grecian Jews um, group segment of the church, which, if you'll remember, those were the ones who were originally upset. It was the Hellenist Grecian Jews who were upset. So all of these people have Greek names, which means that part of the solution was uh, engaging the, the folks who were upset in addressing the problem and not just saying, okay, we hear you up, you're upset. Um, we will uh, force this and make this happen. Um, so stop worrying about it. But instead, they engaged with the uh, disgruntled, as it were, and said, okay, well, if, if you don't like the way uh, things are going, which is okay, maybe things aren't going so well, but if you've got a problem with it, then come on here, let's select seven of you and make it better, you know, get to work. You know, if, if, it's not, if it's not going great now, then do something about it. Go for it, go for it. Um, let's see. So how do the apostles signify the new leadership roles of these seven newly elected leaders? What do the apostles do to signify that these folks are now leaders in the group? Yes, the laying on of hands, as we still practice today, means that it's a, it's a symbol of God's blessing and the community's blessing flowing on those people to empower them to do this job, that they are called to this work and that their work is blessed, is blessed. So, let's see, I read, I got one more on my right sideways. No, but share the blessing to bless the process like we're going to do this work we bless you to help resolve it so the results of treating this conflict in a mature way are evident in the last verses that we read what does it say it said after this after they handled it it said the word of god spread and the number of disciples increased dramatically in verse 7 and then this problem is never mentioned again. It's never mentioned again. So that shows us that the way it was handled was indeed wise and mature and productive and healthy. So we should take note of that because we are humans. We are in a group of other humans. And so it should never surprise us ever that sometimes there will be conflict and disagreements even in a family, even in roommates. When I was in college, my best friend in college was my roommate. Sometimes we didn't get along. Sometimes we got upset at each other. So even best friends will sometimes get upset at each other. Conflict is just a part of being in a relationship with other humans. The right thing to do is to recognize it and to handle it in a mature way, in a helpful way, and in a healthy way so that good things can come afterwards instead of hurt, bad feelings, more upsetness, um, resentment, or guilt if it wasn't handled well. Um, we, we don't want any of those to be the result. We want to follow the great example of the 12 apostles here um, so that today when conflicts happen, uh, there can be good results. Because there can be good results from conflict if there's something going down that that needs improved or needs attention. Maybe, maybe this really needed some attention. Maybe some folks were getting left out. So it was right that they addressed it. So uh, keep those things in mind. Keep those charts and let them uh, kind of seep into your brain as you see and hear about conflicts and good and bad ways to address them and to resolve them. 
and uh, know that you will uh, be part of conflicts in the future because you're human and you're in families and you're in churches and groups. The important thing is to handle it in the right and mature and Christ-like way, which, as we said, might depend on the circumstance. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next week.